special guests, mesdames and messieurs, ladies and gentlemen. Please rise and join us for the singing of O Canada, which will be sung by Ms. Pamela Moffat. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command with glowing hearts we see thee rise the true nor strong and free from far and wide o canada we stand on guard for thee God keep our land glorious and free. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you, Pam, very much for singing such a beautiful rendition of O Canada for us this morning. I would also would like to thank the Kempfa Legion Pipes and Drums for leading us this morning. Thank you uh, for leading the color party and starting off this ceremony today. Good morning, bienvenue. On behalf of Parks Canada and the Royal Canadian Legion, I would like to welcome and thank everyone for coming here today to Fort Wellington National Historic Site, a focal point in the town of Prescott located within the traditional homelands of the Mohawk Nation. My name is Elizabeth Pilon and I'm pleased to be the MC for today's ceremony as we remember the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War. Nous avons plusieurs invités ici avec nous aujourd'hui. This morning we have several invited guests with us to here today. I would like to thank Mr. Gord Brown, Member of Parliament for Leeds Grenville, Mr. Steve Clark, Member of Provincial Parliament for Leeds Grenville, Mr. Brett Todd, Mayor of Prescott, Ms. Darlene Banning, Deputy Reeve, Augusta Township, Mr. John Hunter, Deputy Mayor, Edwardsburg Cardinal, Commanding Officer, Colonel M.S. Heron, and Regimental Sergeant Major C.W.O. A.W. McKenzie, both from the Brockville Rifles National Defence Canada for attending this commemoration this morning. Also today we have with us Ms. Pam Owen, Chaplain for the Royal Canadian Legion and Ms. Pascal Gaindon, a historian with Parks Canada. We also, as you can see, have many representatives from the Royal Canadian Legion, including Prescott, Kempville, Spencerville, Cardinal, Iroquois, Morrisburg and Brockville branches all participating in this special commemoration this morning. 100 years ago, as the Dominion of Canada, our country's foreign affairs were controlled by the British government in London. Therefore, when Britain declared war on August 4, 1914, the British colonies, including Canada and Newfoundland, were automatically at war. The question Canada faced was not whether to go to war, but rather how much we would choose to contribute to the war effort. We are here today at Prescott Cenotaph, but there are cenotaphs like this in every community, large or small, from coast to coast. Men and women from all walks of life made many sacrifices. Canadian society experienced great, great stress and strain throughout the war years. The war tested and ultimately transformed Canada. And the First World War is generally recognized as when Canada became a country. Today, August 4th, we mark the commemoration of the centennial of the First World War and in doing so are remembering and acknowledging the contribution that small communities across this country made. Fort Wellington was a staging ground for troops 
and supplies, so it is very fitting that this community cenotaph is situated here behind me as a reminder of this area's military history and sacrifices to Canada. This history is being shared with many generations in Canada, lest we forget. It is coming close to 11 minutes past the hour, and I will ask uh, everyone to rise. I think some of you are still <laughs> standing, so I will ask everyone to rise as we will have the last post followed by two minutes of silence. Our ceremony will then continue to include a 21-gun salute by the Fort Wellington Volunteer and Artillery Crews. I would now like to ask Ms. Ruth Duclo to play the last post as we begin our two minutes, or followed by two minutes of silence.
I would now like to invite Chaplain Pam Owen to offer a prayer at this morning's service. Let us pray. God of peace and remembrance, we have gathered together today in your presence to respectfully recognize the outbreak of the terrible conflict known as the First World War. When Canada entered into the conflict, brave men and women from across the country answered the call to war. They fought on land, in the trenches, they fought from the water and on the beaches and they fought from the air. Heavy casualties were reported, and many died. Some were reported missing in action, and of those who did return home, they were forever changed by war. Today we pray for those who laid down their lives for freedom and truth. We pray for those who were lost, missing in action, and for their families who never received closure. And we pray for those who did return, changed forever by the horrors of war. May all have found peace. We commend your, their souls into your gracious keeping, and we pray that we may be worthy of their sacrifice. We invite you, Lord, into our midst today as we commemorate the beginning of the First World War, not to glorify war, but to pay our respects to those who have laid down their lives for the many who returned, and for the families of all. We pray for peace, which we all hope to see in our lifetimes. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Owen. Maintenant, j'invite Madame Pascal Guindon du parler de l'histoire de la guerre et le rôle et contribution de Prescott durant le conflit. I would like to ask Ms. Pascal Gendon to tell us more about the First World War and Prescott at that time. Pascal joined Parks Canada as student interpreter here at Fort Wellington many years ago and is now a research historian in our national office, whose grandfather was from Brockville and was a veteran of the Second World War. She has led research into the stories of many World War I soldiers, including Prescott's own Lieutenant Sharp, as part of the national commemorations of the First World War. Pascal? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to take the next few minutes to uh, offer a little bit of historical perspective on the events of 100 years ago. The First World War began in August of 1914 and ended in November of 1918. It saw Canada fight as part of the British Empire in an alliance which went to war against Germany, Austria-Hungary, and later Turkey and Bulgaria. A century ago, the Dominion of Canada was just 47 years old. There were a mere 8 million Canadians, the vast majority of whom lived in rural areas. In most places, horse-drawn vehicles were still the norm, and telephones and even electricity were a rarity. Radio and film were in their infancy, and women did not yet have the right to vote in federal elections. Canada was a self-governing dominion within the British Empire. Its foreign affairs were controlled by London. When Great Britain declared war, the British Empire, including Canada and the independent colony of Newfoundland, were automatically at war. And as we heard earlier, the question Canadians face was not whether to go to war, but how much they would choose to contribute to the war effort. At the beginning, Canadians volunteered with patriotic fervor. As the war wore on, however, the government compelled more and more Canadians to take part in the war effort. Canadian society experienced great stresses and strains through the war years, uh, and it was an experience which tested and ultimately transformed Canada, not only politically, but also socially, economically, and technologically. One of the most stunning victories for Canadian forces was the capture of Vimy Ridge in France from the Germans in April of 1917. 
Victory, however, came at an extremely high cost during four bloody days of attack. Over 10,000 Canadians were killed or wounded. One of the participants, Lieutenant Alfred Lawson, who was originally recruited into the 90th Canadian Infantry Battalion, Winnipeg Rifles, recounted the nightmare in a letter he wrote following the battle. In a frank account, he describes the mood hours before being called to the front, the intense bombardment of enemy artillery fire, the chaos and the horrors of battle, and the moment he thought that death had found him. The most touching moment, perhaps, is revealed in the final paragraph. He wrote, As soon as I got back from the front lines, there was a parcel containing a fine pair of socks made by a nice young lady of Prescott. I was delighted as my feet were soaking, and although, although we were out of the front line still, it was the next day before we were able to get any of our personal effects. Uh, it's not known if Lieutenant Lawson knew the identity of this young woman, but after experiencing hell in a place far from Canada, it was a small gesture of support from this very community that gave him comfort and relief, both physical as well as emotional. Uh, although far from the trenches of Europe, those on the home front back here in Canada were also deeply affected by the war. Many pitched in to do their bit to support the war effort, including young girls who made bandages for the medical corps or crafted handmade articles of clothes for care packages. And it's clear from Lieutenant Lawson's letter that Prescott residents did not shy away from their patriotic duty. Prescott and the surrounding areas have a long and proud military history extending back over two centuries. Because of its significant rail and marine connections, the, efforts, uh, the effects of the Great War were felt throughout the town where the mobilization of troops and supplies destined for overseas would have been a common sight. Here at Fort Wellington, which at the time of the war was under the control of the Department of Militia and Defense, the fort served as a training ground to prepare troops for overseas service and an, as a militia armory, used in particular by two local regiments, the 56th Regiment and the 4th Jussards, a cavalry unit with headquarters here in town. Around the time of the outbreak of the First World War, these regiments, together with other local forces, patrolled the St. Lawrence River frontier and were stationed at vulnerable points of attack, such as the canal system between here and Cornwall. Even though it was in Europe that tensions were escalating and not necessarily along the Canada-US border, uh, as was the case in the 19th century, this vigilance was not so outlandish. Because in the spring of 1914, a man posing as a German officer on a tour of Canada was suspected of being a spy on a mission to collect information on the defenses along the St. Lawrence River. One of the more notable stories of Prescott's connection to the First World War is, believe it or not, with Canada's early attempt to organize an air force. In September of 1914, the Canadian Air Corps was created with three airmen being appointed, one of which was a young man born right here in Prescott in 1892, Lieutenant William Frederick Nelson Sharp. Sharp learned to fly at the Curtis Flying School in San Diego, California, and when war erupted, he returned to Canada to offer his services as an airman. And you have to remember, this is at a time when aviation was still in its infancy. Lieutenant Sharp sailed overseas and received additional flying instruction in England and in France. And while on a solo flight training exercise with Britain's Royal Flying Corps on February 4th, 1915, Lieutenant Sharp's biplane crashed, killing the young pilot. He was 22 years old. At the request of his family, Lieutenant Sharp's remains were repatriated and large crowds of mourners gathered in the streets here in town to pay their respect during his funeral. He rests at Sandy Hill Cemetery, where his grave is identified by a headstone of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. He is also commemorated in the First World War Book of Remembrance, housed in the Memorial Chamber of the Parliament of Canada in Ottawa, on the Community Cenotaph, and honoured through Prescott's local Air Cadet Squadron. Lieutenant Sharp Courage and Sacrifice as a pioneer military aviator was honoured with a memorial cross granted since 1919 to grieving mothers and widows 
as a memento of personal loss. Lieutenant Sharp did leave behind a, a young widow. Today, we begin the commemoration of the centennial of the First World War, an international conflict that had significant repercussions in Canada. When the conflict began, few realized what was being set into motion, but by war's end, the war to end all war had become a man-made catastrophe without parallel up to that time. In a conflict that saw approximately 9 million souls perish globally, casualties were immediate and heavy. The horror shocked the world. Canada emerged from the Great War victorious and with a newfound status on the international stage. But it came at a very high human cost. Of the approximately 700,000 Canadians who donned a uniform, more than 60,000 men and women were killed in action or died of injury or disease. Another 170,000 were wounded and countless others returned home suffering emotional scars. All Canadians were touched by the war and its repercussions have reverberated down the generations. We will remember their contributions and their sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. As we have just heard, the First World War touched every community and changed our country. I would now like to invite the Royal Canadian Legion members from the various uh, branches across our re or region to come up and read the names. I would like to invite Mr. Barney Barnhart and Mr. Joe, Mr. Gordon Knapper from Brockville, Ronald Munnings from Cardinal, Ralph Martin from Iroquois Matilda, Dr. Graham Hoos from Morrisburg, June Aiken from Spencerville, Fiona Plunkett from Kentville, and Mr. Frank Murphy of Prescott to come to the podium one after the other and present the names of residents of each of these communities who made the ultimate sacrifice for Canada during the First World War. So Mr. Barney Barnhart and Mr. Gordon Knapper, if you could come forward. Morning. The following long list of soldiers who died as a result of the First World War was compiled following the war. A large bronze plaque with most of this information was erected later in the Memorial Arena on Gilmore Street. That plaque is presently in the lobby of the newer Brockville Civic Memorial Center in the North End. That list is Sergeant Joe Abbey, Sergeant Henry Charles Ablard, Corporal George Dunbar Acton, Private Walter Frederick Ammond, Private Conrad C.F. Anderson, Private John Esley Anderson, Private John Thomas Astrid, Albert Henry Baker, Private Victor Albert Baker, Private Wilford Baker, Private Francis B. Barnes, Private George M. M. Barnes, Private Lawrence Bell, Private Wilford Mayu Bertrand, Elmer Uriah Bishop, Joseph Norton Bishop, Lynn N. Bissell, Second Lieutenant William Albert Booth, Private John Botsford, Corporal Cecil Johnston Bovard, Private Ernest George Bowman, Private Percy Allen Bromley, Sergeant Albert John Brewster, Private Huey Hubert E. Brock, Private Cecil Howard Buell, Private Joseph Henry Nelson Buell, Private Thomas Fulton Burns, Private Arthur Campbell, Private Edmund Campbell, Private Cyrus Star 
Stuart Carr, Gunner Leonard Champagne, Lieutenant Jackson Chapman, Lieutenant William John Chapman, Private Leon Arthur Chevalli, W. Brock Coates. George Kahn, Private. Driver, Thomas Edward Cook. Lieutenant Raymond Corbett. Corporal Clayton Crawford. Private Robert Joseph Deegan. Captain William Deere. Oh, excuse me, Corporal. Private Lawrence Charles Devine. Private William Campbell Diamond. Corporal James Down. Gunner Vector Driver. Flight Sub-Lieutenant Lawrence James Dunham. Private William Albert Durand. Private John Eason. Major Herbert Hamilton Edwards. Sergeant William Enos. Private Neville Ferris. Lieutenant Harry Waterman Fisher. James S. Fleming. Corporal James Kenneth Fluker. Brigadier Alan A. Fraser. Brigadier Farquhar Caldwell Fraser. Private John J. Frigo. Private Harry Glazier. Captain William Nelson Graham. Frederick W. Gray. James H. Grube. Lieutenant R. Gordon Hamilton. Private James Hanna. Private Arthur Harvey. Lieutenant Arthur Stuart Heron. Private Roy Heron. Quarter Sergeant William N. Hescox. Private George Hood. Private Arthur Hooker. Wilford Horrigan. Private Thomas Joseph Hunter. Lieutenant Glenn L. B. James. Carmen Jones. Lieutenant Colonel Elmer W. Jones, DSO. Private Alfred Edward Kelly. Private John Henry Kelly. Private Andrew Joseph Keon. Private William J. Kerr. Private George Frederick King. Lieutenant Arthur William Nill. Sergeant Leonard Law, Private James Gordon Levere, Private James Lope, Private George McKay, Lieutenant William Herbert McKay, Private Frank Maher, Private Robert Millett, Private A. Leo Mahana, Private Ernest Marchin. Corporal John Alexander Mates, Private John A. McConaughey, Fred McCormick, Lance Corporal Peter Kirk, Sergeant Harold Clifford McKay, Private Alexander McKenzie, Corporal Michael, Michael McMahon, Corporal John Milne, Private Samuel Moody, Captain Edward Cecil H. Moore, Lieutenant Graham Mowat, Captain Sterndale Murphy, Lieutenant Telford Hamilton Murray, Private George Rosalie Newis, Private Frederick Nickel, Private William McLean Nickel, Private Walter William Noble, Charles Anson Dunn, Gunner Roderick O'Connor, Lieutenant Colonel James V.P. O'Donohue, Private jo Charles Herbert O'Leary, Private William J. O'Reilly, Flight Lieutenant John Albert Page, Private Clifford Lord Pask, Private John William Penfold,
Private Maxim Pol Pololak, F. W. Pritchard, Clarence F. Raisin, Private Ernest Horatio Redden, Private Rodney Reynolds, Gunner Russell Rice, Private Ernest Roy Riches, Private Andrew Robertson, Lance Corporal Herbert J. Robertson, Private Arthur Rooney, Private Leonard Fred Rowe, Private David M. Russell, Private Olive, Olive Louise Sanjusi, Driver Thomas J. Sheridan, Private Harry E. Simmons, Private Percy Allen Simmons, Private John Simpson, Gunner Elwood G. Starr, Private Wilford Charles Stevens, Private J. Robert Stinson, Private William Stratton, Private Charles James Summers, Private Reginald Francis Trevor, William Turland, Private Frederick Allen Turner, Quarter Sergeant Harry Howard Vance, Private Harry Clifford Waddy, Byron W. Walker, Lieutenant George Wallace, Corporal John Henry Weber, Private Walter Welch, Frank Whaley, Lieutenant George K. K. Wilgress, Gunner George Joseph Wilkins, Private William John Wilson, Corporal William Bruce Wilson, and Private Percy Wines. Names transcribed from the Cardinal Cenotaph, George Leo Amel, Percy Amer, William Armstrong, Percy Barton, Freeman Barton, Clinton Bickham, Cameron Coyle, Charles Hanafy, John Hughes, William Hughes, David Ingram, Gordon Lev, James Lev, Neil Monroe, Paul Reed, Walter Scott, Don Teo, Charles Watts. Thank you. The names of the soldiers were transcribed at the Iroquois and Matilda Cenotaphs. John Aaron, William Armstrong, Ward Alt, Charles F. Barkley, Edward Bicom, Percy Bristow, Jose Calloran, William Dillon, Frank Doran, William Ellis, Alan Fisher, James Gowdy, William Gray, Carmen Hutchison, J. Herbert Johnston, Harold McGregor, John Markell, Wilfred McGinn, Ernest McNulty, Bertram McQuaig, Orlin Merkley, Reginald Mundy, Franklin Osborne, Fred Quickfall, David Robertson, Lee Sipes, William Thwaite, Thomas Tripney, Orville Walters, W. Brock Wells, Frank Wirt, and Basil Wiley. These are the names from the Memorial Cenotaph in Morrisburg and in Williamsburg for those who lost their lives in World War I. D. Bradfield, R. M. Karkner, J. H. Froats, C. H. Gillespie, O. G. Harper, 
G. A. Levis, C. Lewis, G. Lewis, G. H. Meikle, D. Merkley, F. Monroe, who was a nursing sister uh, that died in Greece, D. H. Prunner, F. Quickfall, F. Rice, D. Robertson, K. T. Stata, E. Steen, I. Tinkus, H. K. Wells, H. S. Weingard, O. Woods, and J. Wyatt. Thank you. These soldiers are transcribed from the Cenotaph in Spencerville. Private Josie Cook, Sergeant Richard Gooden, Lieutenant W. Roy Kingston, T. W. F. McKnight, Private William H. Johnson, Private James F. Hamill, Private Neil W. Monroe, Private D. C. Doyle, Lieutenant Weston Ward Pitt, Private Leroy Mc McEdis, Private Willie Col Collins, Private Freeman G. Burton, Private Charles N. Hanafy, Private John Sifton, Lieutenant Harlow Tripp, Private Newton Henderson, Private William Armstrong, Second Lieutenant Baldwin McDougall, Private George L. Amill, Private Roland Whitting, Private Percy A. Barton, Sergeant Alex Lyon McKenzie, Sergeant Roy Lindsay, Gunner R. G. Hillard Riddell, Private Herman Cook, Gunner W. A. Dunlop, Nurse Laura A. Montgomery Shorey. These are the names transcribed from the Kempville Sanitaph. It includes Kempville, Oxford, South Goer, South Mountain, and all that extending area. Major Horace Hutchins, Captain J. H. McDermott, Lieutenant A. E. Oakes, Sergeant A. Delane, Sergeant J. Bennett, Sergeant Robert Percy Barr, DCM, Private George Gray, Private R. McKay, Private Harry Johnson Carson, Private H. Maxwell, Private Nathan Basil LaPlante, Private C. D. O'Leary, Private Ambrose Arcand, Private Thomas Augustus Arcand, Private H. Andrews, Private J. E. Arcand, Private W. Stewart, Private Charles Hurlbert, Private Martin Leo Carlin, Private J. Moran, Private Thomas James Beckett, Private Alfred Cayley, Private Ernest Rupert Davy, Private George Gordon Howey, Private John Edward McCrum, Private Harvey Milburn McCrum, Private E. High Hasting, Private Andrew Balfour Irvin, Private S. Hudson, Private W. Copping, Private John Arthur Jeffrey, Private Jesse Humphrey, Private A. McDermott, Private A. Worlds, Private A. Scott, Private I. Cooper, and Private J. A. Stewart. These are the names inscribed on the cenotaph behind me. Arthur E. Baker, Howard Baker, Philip W. Blacklock, Cecil Bovaird, Ward Burke, John H. Davy, Jacob S. Doyle, G. Harvey Ewart, Ira H. Glasgow, Albert Holbert, Royal W. Kingston, E. William Lane, Roy Lindsay, John A. McDonald, Charles H. O'Leary, Guy C. O'Shea, George Patterson, Edward Patterson, 
James Peterson, William Robinson, William F. Sharp, Henry J. Smith, John R. W. Tyner, Stanley W. Ward, and Wilford L. White. Thank you. The Cenotaph, like all those erected across the country, is a constant reminder of those who fell during the war. I would like to thank the Royal Canadian Legion for sharing the names of the fallen and reminding us of the real impact to many families and communities across Canada. I would now like to invite Mr. Richard Lees, a First World War reenactor, to read in Flanders Fields. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amongst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Thank you very much. I now asked uh, Chaplain Owen to present a benediction and blessing. Loving God of remembrance, as we draw to a close, we ask and pray that you help us to be faithful and true to the ideals for which these brave souls fought and suffered, returned and passed away. May we continue to perpetuate the memory of our departed comrades by our service to our country, our community, our comrades, and to remember our obligations. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Thank you, Chaplain Owen. Now I invite Miss Pamela Moffat to lead us in the singing of God Save the Queen. If everyone could please rise. God save our gracious queen, long live our noble queen, long to reign over us. God save the queen, send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over oh, for us, God save the Queen. Thank you, Miss Moffat. Uh, this concludes the formal part of today's ceremony, but I would like to invite everyone over to the Fort's Visitor Center for Lemonade and Coffee and to view the special exhibit about Prescott's own Lieutenant William Sharp including his memorial metal cross that is on loan from the National Aviation or National Air Force Museum and several other artifacts from the World War I time period. I would like to thank our bugler, Mrs. Ruth Duclos, um, and our pipers, Mike Durant and Brad McVeigh, and the Prescott for cadets for attending today. We would especially like to thank the Prescott Legion, Branch 97, for their organizing support and offering advice. We also really appreciate the involvement of the other Legion branches from the sound surrounding communities for their particip participation in today's ceremony. 
Merci à tous vous êtes venus aujourd'hui. Thank you all for coming today to remember the contributions and sacrifices that our local communities made to Canada during the Great War. I now invite the Kenful Pipes and Drums to march off the Coloured Party and conclude our event. Thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you.